Welcome back to another episode of the Agent Investor Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Caffarella. Um, like I mentioned a few weeks ago, I'm starting to do some formatting changes, and which is leading me to my very special guest today, Leanne Vong, um, where not only am I going to be interviewing people kind of across the country, but I'm also going to be interviewing people that have passed through my life um, that are agent investors. And so I want to welcome Leanne to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm well. How are you? Thanks for having Good. me. Good. Good. So um, yeah, it's interesting. I'm I, I before you know you jumped on, I started to think back, like, okay, how did I meet you? How did the story go? And this is kind of if if I can, if my memory serves me correctly, and I think you made fun of me for this. I think we got introduced, and instead of me calling you, I sent you a Facebook message, right? Yeah, exactly. And I thought it was like, I thought it was fake. Yeah. Um, kind of my claim to fame of not having probably the best personal skills. I think uh, someone had told me, they said, oh, you know, she's an investor. She's an agent. You know, I think she'd be a really good fit, you know, for the brokerage. And I was like, oh, okay, let me just look her up on Facebook and send her a message. And um, still doing that kind of stuff today. So I haven't improved my social skills at all. But um but yeah, so so you you um you joined our brokerage. What was that back? Maybe like 2018 ish, 19. Like, do you remember? Yeah, it was 18. I got licensed in 18, and I did like one deal with like a you know a smaller brokerage, and I knew um, that I like I needed like like a place where I really needed a lot of guidance because excuse me, I didn't know what I didn't know, mm -hmm. um. And I wanted to uh, explore like investing because I had personally done it myself. And I was like, okay, what's an agency that can teach me how to do this? Um, yeah. And Cameron was like literally, and I think still like the only like brokerage in the game for that <clears throat> specific niche. And I still talk about that. I, I, I said that maybe like a couple of episodes ago. I, I don't get it. I still, I still don't understand why there aren't more brokerages who focus on it because most agents want to invest in real estate. And even if they don't want to invest in real estate, they have clients who invest in real estate. And it just always seemed like to me, I mean, like I've put effort into, into building out the brokerage, mm -hmm. but you know, we didn't go from having, you know, zero to 350 agents in five years because I really did anything special other than focus on the investing side, which has allowed us to attract a lot of people. Um, so yeah, it was interesting. So anytime that we bring, you know, an agent, you know, into the company, it's like a crapshoot. You never know if they're going to sell two houses, sell a hundred houses, whatever. And, um, you know, I had been introduced to you and I think work with you like a little bit and I, the brokerage isn't my main business. Right. So, you know, I'm, I'm focused on investing, helping people invest. And then I start seeing your name keep coming up on these commission statements. And I'm like, you know, what, what the heck is going on here? And, and that's when really like, you know, you started to kind of like blow up and, and do a ton of deals. And I feel like that like went from like zero to like a hundred, like very, very fast. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I want to start by going backwards in time. I know I, I jumped in cause we know each other, but like, when, when did you actually like first start? Cause you got into real estate young, but like, when did you first start thinking about getting into real estate? Um, so like my story with like real estate investing and like really understanding that space was, um, probably around 2013. Um, so like my, my background is like owning salons. So we had like, you know, a family business and we were trying to figure out how to like invest in anything, but like that actual business when we were, you know, finally making some money. Um, and, and that's how I got introduced to real estate was like my mom, um, and understanding that asset class, we bought like a um, foreclosure house. This was in 13, you know, for like 160,000 or something ridiculous. Yeah. But what, like, what made you guys decide that you want to invest? It was just like you had like excess money from, from like being profitable. Like what, 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 or, or was the plan, like, did the family want to get out of that business or was it just like you had capital that you wanted to kind of like deploy? Um, I think that it was a little bit of both. I, you know, we're not, you know, rocket scientists and we had like this grand vision of like definitely exiting the business, but you know, that specific industry is just not something that you, you stay in forever. Mm -hmm. Um, it's similar to agency, right? Like there's a huge burnout rate. 
Um, mm-hmm. So we knew we wanted to diversify. Yes, we were profitable. So we were trying to figure out how to take advantage of the market. And then now with our, um, our excess like capital, um, really, I, I credit my mom with a lot of this stuff. It's like she literally started going on YouTube and she was just like Googling. And then she discovered what LoopNet was and then Crexy and kind of all these things. And like she would be she was com- incredibly like entrepreneurial. And so just was very self-taught. And then we had toured a million houses in Manchester uh, because our salons were in Southern New Hampshire. So that was the obvious market. Um, And then and then we finally executed. But um, it was probably like a year of like learning, like on YouTube and like understanding that space and Grant Cardone and all that stuff before we really executed. Yeah, I think everybody does that. And I think like that's one thing that it's funny because people that are successful, I feel like they're really students. Mm-hmm. And I see kind of like a lot of people that they they want to invest, but then I don't hear that story from them. Like, I don't hear the story about like how they watched a million webinars, how they went to conferences, how they read books. Like y- you only see that with people who actually end up kind of doing it. So that, that first asset that you purchased, it was a multi one multifamily. Like what was it exactly? Yeah. So it was my personal one was a three family. It was in Manchester. Um, it was kind of like all different funny mistakes that like knowing what I know now, I would have executed very differently, but I got that using a commercial loan, 25% down. It was like, I think it's literally was like 250,000 for a three family. Yep. Um, yeah. So that was my first deal. And then we actually sold it a little over a year after we made some money on it. Now, why did you sell it? Um, that was when I was, uh, I didn't really want to own in Manchester anymore. It just wasn't proving to be like the area I wanted to stay long term. Um, and we had captured some good equity on it. I think we made, you know, something like 80,000 on that, you know, during our shorter um, ownership when, you know, the market was going up. So we were able to capture that right away. And then where, where did you guys go from there? So, you know, I think about these things like in in different chapters, right? So like had that like REO house in Concord, that was where our main business was. So we we needed a place to live. And then we used, uh, we improved that house. We got an equity line out and bought like about five, six properties in Manchester. So that was all within, you know, that was year one. And then year two was, was a bulk in Manchester. And then starting to liquidate some of that and understanding where else we could buy. And we landed in Fall River. Um, about 18 ish months after. Um, and we bought a 16 unit portfolio there. So that mm-hmm. was my second larger purchase. So what, what made you, you started obviously just by default, kind of like where you had the business. Right. And then what made you say, I mean, I think I know the answer to this, but what made you go down to fall river? It was certainly like, it was thicker, right? Like, like the, the prices were so attractive <laughs> We got this portfolio. It, it's it's a bigger pocket story. It's, it's what people dream about. 16 units, owner financing, zero money down. The rate was like two and a half. Um, you know, there were some fine prints in that deal, obviously, you know, um, but it was, it was like very um, attractive in terms of like the returns or whatever potential there was going to be. So I know obviously like, you know, probably like two thirds of our listener base is in New England, but For the people who aren't in New England, uh, Leanne basically went like she's starting in Manchester, New Hampshire, which is a pretty high cap rate area. Right. Definitely like a lot of crime, like, you know, a lot of nonsense there. And then she went to an even higher cap rate area, even more of that. So, um, so, you know, we call that chasing yield. Right. So um, I've definitely done that. And I think it's interesting because it's a common thing. And I actually don't even know from that point on what you guys ended up doing. So I'm curious what happened after that, but you basically went from like pretty high cap rate to basically fall river at that time had to be the highest cap rate in Massachusetts. Right. Or if it wasn't, it was close to it. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was very, very attractive. And the fact that I had seller financing, like it was, it was ridiculous. Like, you know, it was a a classic driving around everywhere. We went to Holyoke, we would do these like tours, you know, we would like, you know, like look at different houses in towns and we were just driving by Fall River and we, we saw a for sale by owner side, you know, and facilitated it from there. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Very unique experience there. (laughs) 
Okay. And then that was around the time that you got your real estate license, right? Or maybe yeah, that was roughly. after? Yeah, it was about seven year 2017 when I bought that uh, portfolio. Okay. And then what made you even like decide to get your real estate license? So um, I had I had taken that real estate class in roughly 2016, you know, knowing that like real estate was like fun and something that like I would be interested in uh, for a million and one reasons. I didn't take the test, which is actually very common. Right. Yeah. Um, and then when I knew and I just felt like it was really time for me to exit the salon business and, and I just felt like I, I needed a change. Um, I got my real estate license because not because I, I decided this was going to be my path, like for investing and things like that. It was literally for a career change. Mm, okay. So then, you know, you, you sold a house at a, some other brokerage, joined our brokerage. Um, and I think at that time, cause, cause you ended up like, I mean, where you ended up going for the most part with your client base is like working with investors. But right. when you got here and I could be wrong about this, but that wasn't your plan when you got here, was it? Um, for me, when, when I got to Cameron, when I did my first deal and it was like my mom who gave me my first deal, you know, yeah. like, just like, just do something. And so she did. Um, and so that, like, I really, that was a six unit property. And like, I remember asking my, my, um, my broker, you know, at the other place, like, like, how does this work? Like, you know, everything. And they like, they only knew the technical aspect of it. And I knew that like, I was going to very quickly outgrow them because I really wanted to learn about investing. Um, because I, I would sit there, you know, uh, starting my new career and like being like, what do I have to offer a consumer today? You mm -hmm. know, like everybody dreams about selling, you know, the $10 million house, but I don't know anything about the $10 million house. Right. Mm -hmm. But I do know something about cap rates. I do know something about owning property, being a landlord. I said, well, I can speak about that, you know, and so I sought out Cameron very specifically because of the training. Um, you know, I found like, you know, things that you've done online, flipping, things like that. Like I knew that it was going to be like a really good learning experience for me to understand truly all the investing tools that I could tap into. Yeah. The crazy thing about what you just said, though, about like picking that for a niche, which like it drives me crazy <clears throat> is everybody, not everybody, but so many people want to sell, you know, million dollar luxury houses. And like you said, they know nothing about them. They don't know the first thing about how to even get a deal like that. And they don't want to sell a six family in Fall River that's like $600,000, right. which is a lot easier of a deal, a lot easier to get. Right. Um, and, and at the end of the day, like, you know, when, when I talked about the fact that your numbers just started, you know, going and going and going. I, I I didn't even at that point put together what you were doing because I didn't know that you were specifically focused on working with investment buyers. I just saw that you were doing deals. Um, but it's crazy, like, as you know, even if you think about like the people that you started with, like how many of them are even left in real estate? Like only 10 or 15% of the people that you started with are even still in real estate. And it's like, it's because you carved out, you know, that niche. Um so you got here and then again, at what point though, did you say that you wanted to do that? Like, was that before you got here or after you got here? Um, I went to Cameron with the intention to do it. Like, Hey, listen, my, my plans could completely fall in. And I'd be like, you know, and like, like the, the stars wouldn't have aligned and like, I would have maybe found something about the industry. I just didn't like. Right. Mm -hmm. But pretty much I, I made a decision you should join Cameron because because I wanted to be an investor agent. Yeah. Um, and I credit a lot of Cameron and like the C90 room, like which we all laugh about that, like C90 experience. Yeah. As like really creating the foundation for who I am today. Um, I, I lead a team today and I, I like to reference stories from that. You know, no one believes me that I would, I would cold call for two yeah. hours. And if I didn't get those two leads, like, cause I, I average, you know, uh, an appointment an hour. Right. Yeah, so if I yeah. didn't get those two. I would keep calling. Yeah. yeah because yeah. I had nothing else to do. No, I know. And it's it's funny because like so many people have nothing else to do with them. They, they would just quit and not and not do it, you know. So yeah. um, but so you you made this decision. You're like, OK, I want to work with investor clients. Well, that's great. Well, how do you actually get the investor clients to kind of like want to work with you? 
And I think you have the knowledge, right? Because, but a lot of people, this is like the part with marketing that's so hard. It's like, okay, you could be good at what you do. You could be an investor yourself, but then how do you actually get other investors or prospective investors to like trust you and even find you? Yeah. So that that's a, a multitude of ways, right? So like certainly, you know, you create kind of all the profiles on social media and things like that. Um, I think because I, I had some relationships in the Boston area already, like I would like call people. Cold calling really helped me get into the door. And then because I had a lead, which whatever that meant to me, but like if I had a house to sell, I was motivated to sell that house, you know, whether I ever close in it or not. So then like having one, two, three Main Street, it's probably a dump, right? Then it would like start my brain in who would want to buy that house, right? So I would contact potentially lenders, like, you know, doing kind of idiotic things that kind of paid off in the end, but calling a lender and being like, hey, you're a hard money lender. I think your clients probably want a house like this. You know, do you know any clients? They would introduce me to John Smith. I would talk BS to them because... I probably had no idea what I was talking about. Yep. But well, you had a house though. So that's more than what most people had. Right. And then, and then I would meet them and then, then they would be looking for deals. Like all these developers are always looking for deals. So then I was like, okay, like I can help you, you know? And then I would sit on MLS and find, and it, that was a repeated process over and over. Um, I, you know, I have presence on bigger pockets. And so like, you know, replying to forums and like really making a, like an impression on that website, you know, gave me some opportunities. Um, I remember my first real deal was 134,000. Um, and it was from, it was actually something that had, I contacted somebody on bigger pockets and literally BS, right? Like, like writing email saying, Hey, like I'm a real estate agent. You know, I, I heard you're looking for a deal. I can help you find a deal. I would look at MLS and um and find a deal i had no clients for these deals yep. you know and then again calling a vendor calling somebody i knew and be like this is a really good deal do you know anyone who wants this deal yeah 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 so so you were identifying them both on market and off market yep Hey everyone, this is Tom Caffarella. I want to quickly interrupt the podcast to number one, thank all of my loyal listeners of the Agent Investor Podcast and tell you guys really quickly about an exciting event we have coming up. Uh, It's a two-day event. It's called the Passive Income Real Estate Investor Event um, that you can find out more details at PassiveIncomeEvent.com. We're going to be doing a two-day training session teaching all of the agents and all of the investors at the event on how to achieve financial freedom through real estate. If you're like me and your goal is to not work 80, 100 hours a week grinding, selling real estate, flipping homes, um, definitely check out this event. We're going to teach you how to build a passive income portfolio so that you can retire, so that you can work when you want, how you want, and ultimately achieve financial freedom. So again, go to PassiveIncomeEvent.com for more details. And we look forward to seeing you at the upcoming event. So I never thought about the hard money angle, but that makes a lot of sense, right? Because if you if you have a relationship with any hard money lender, who are they lending to? They're lending anybody who they're going to tell you is a real person. Right. I think I think that's one of the struggles that, like if if I was saying, if a new agent came up to me and they said they want to work with investors, one thing I'd be nervous about for them is like all these people who are never going to buy a house. Right. But if you go to a hard money lender, anybody they refer you to probably hasn't just bought one house. They probably are a repeat buyer. Right. And they're already pre-approved. And like, so yourself and, and the this, this hard money lender is aligned to be able to like, you know, move forward the deal, assuming it obviously all makes sense, right? Yeah. Um, and, and likely they're going to have more than one client for that deal, you know? So I realized like kind of earlier on and ben, um, other vendors such as like an attorney might also have clients for this. So all people that are incentivized to be able to have a successful transaction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's not like, it's definitely not, super difficult to find investors. And I think that's another kind of like right. part of part of the whole niche that's nice too. Like, I mean, you could show up at like just an auction and pretty much everybody who's bidding at an auction is a real 
a real investor. Right. But now, how do you then, because yes, there are investors, they want to buy, but you know, the difference between a, a an investor and just a regular retail client is like, well, an investor wants a deal. They don't want to just, uh, they don't want you to just say, oh, okay, here's a list of properties. So like, how are you then once you finding them, differentiating yourself or adding value or doing something so that they're like, oh, like this person gets investing, I want to work with them. Um, so I would like, I'm a fairly organized person. So I would like work really hard to give them like a lot of information and make sure that I put like money where my mouth is in terms of like proving that like this asset, this, this potential opportunity was really the opportunity that I'm like, you know, touting. Um, so I think that came from like me doing like a lot of homework, playing around a lot with MLS right? And like understanding what some of my resources are, you know, public records and stuff like that. If I told you one, two, three Main Street is a freaking deal, you know, you're, I'm going to, you know, it's 300 and I told you it can sell for five. Like I'm going to prove it to you. Like I give you all that data. And Mm -hmm. so what I find, you know, kind of tough with other agents is that they're, they love to talk, but they don't really do the work to be able to prove the point of the work. So like running comps, right? Like like the ARV, um, giving them public information about the lot. Like I understood how to read a table of use. Um, and my clients actually taught me how to do a lot, right? Because they would go in, they would do all that. And I'd be like, oh, cool. You know, and like really leaning into those opportunities and not pretending that I know the answer. And I would always say, like, I can I can tell you what this is worth. Everything else, like, you know, I'm going to learn from you also. Yeah. And I think one thing that you're kind of like hitting on that I think is really important, like just in investing in general is, again, becoming like a student. And like when you're a student and you can actually provide value, like all the stuff that you just mentioned, like it, it takes effort. So it's not just like, OK, I'm an agent. I want to work with investors. This is going to be my niche. And now I just throw up a sign and that's it. Um, I think the good and the bad about working with investors is like, not all of them are super savvy, but most of them can kind of see the difference between somebody who actually knows what they're talking about and someone who doesn't. Whereas again, I'm certainly not going to knock a retail agent, but like a regular traditional home buyer, if you line up five agents, it's going to be tough for them to tell the difference. Right. But if you say to an investor, okay, here's five agents, which one of them knows about investing? Mm-hmm. They can figure it out like really quick. Right. Um, but that's a good thing too, because out of those five people, pro- probably four of them don't know what they're talking about. Right. So it becomes, you know, a differentiator. So um, one other question I, I'm curious about, like, because obviously investors, the the good thing is they they tend to buy more than one property. I mean, their goal is to never buy one, right? Right. So what percentage of your clients that are investors buy more than one property from you? If you had to guess, I know that you probably don't have this number, you know. Actually, I I ironically just had the number because I just did client gifts and I decided for this round, I'm going to do like an end of year, but for this round of presents, I was going to do only clients who have um, purchase more than one with me. Oh, wow. Um, so that, you're going to be on the, you're going to be on the elite list to get the Christmas gift. I love it. Right? No, no. So this, this is uh, the October gift. Everyone's going to get a Christmas gift. Oh, oh okay. 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 Yeah. So, um, so if you, you, you know, done business with me more than once, um, yep. I will, you know, or, or like you felt like they were going to be a really good referral partner. Yep. Um, like I would send it and actually, you know, more or less, I have around 120 clients that I've, I've engaged with, I've done business with. Um, and actually out of that, I sent out 40 gifts. Wow. So again, that's, that's pretty just, good. That, yeah. I mean that, so that's just another, you know, like testament to that methodology. Right. And then. The other 80, that doesn't mean that they're not going to do another deal. Those other 80 probably want to do another deal and they may do another deal. We're talking from two, what is really like, you really got started regardless of 19, you know, that's what I was going to say. I was thinking, I I was thinking a three year window. So like, you know, if you talk about like the average buyer or seller, they transact, I'm going to screw up the stat, but it's like once every seven years. Mm -hmm. So out of, you know, the, the number of people you would have, you would have had like 
way less if they were just traditional, you know, buyers or sellers. You might have had a couple that were repeat, but probably not too many. Right. But again, the the whole thing is all of those people want to repeat. Like right. they're probably not going to, but they want to. Their their desire is to do another deal when they have the opportunity. Um Interesting. So then let's kind of like flip it around. We talked about how you're using investing with your agent business and you've used it, you know, again, like you were always a top producer here. Like, um, how are you using it in your own life? I know you're doing some short-term rentals. Like, what are you focused on for yourself? Um, so I, you know, you should never get in, into a job, like hoping you'll die in a job, right? Like, like our, our goal in life is to be able to get out of these jobs. And yeah. so I knew like, obviously having a taste of, of real estate and cash flow really like actually understood that. Okay. So this is real. I buy it for X and then the yield is, is why it is evident. Right. Mm-hmm. So pretty much as soon as I could buy a house, you know, independently, cause prior is with my family, I did, which I did in August, 2019. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, being really crazy about it, knowing that I had to buy a house, like the second I could, the second I had a dollar, I was going to buy a house and I did. And, um, for me, it was really important to, to like perfect my business, service my clients. Right. But to basically turn that money right away Yep. and finding those opportunities, um, for the most part, like my majority of my holdings are still long-term. And then I have, um, some short-term also, Mm -hmm now just to diversify, but I'm totally open. You know, there's also like this medium term rental, but I buy whatever is mostly in my like comfort level in terms of the the quality of the property and in however way that I can execute it successfully. So what's your thinking like short term versus long term? Like, um, you know, if you had to pick one, like which one do you favor and why? As much as like people are insanely seduced by short term, I'm like a a very tried and true person. You know, I don't, uh, you know, I try not to be shiny objects, right? Um, I'm still a huge believer in in, in long-term rental. It's very consistent. Um, It's it's a check that you can really, really count on. And it's an asset that actually appreciates better. Um, And actually the long-term yield is better overall, even though you don't necessarily see the cash flow, you know, the, the the outpouring like a short-term. So I still favor long-term over short-term, but they both have their benefits. Um, But in terms of like time consumption, um, just to give some perspective, I do a pipeline call with my long-term property management once a month. I do a weekly um, pipeline call with my short-term rental. So yeah. That, that shows you the difference in terms of what is needed. Yeah, exactly. And that's why, like, I've never done a short-term rental mm-hmm. and you mentioned, um, you know, the shiny object. So what about the short-term, I don't know, makes you like kind of use that phrase with it? I think people are like, you know, everybody has stayed in an Airbnb. Everybody has stayed and everybody's complained about it. You know, yep. look at the price and be like, I can't believe they paid two dollars for it. And I got to now I got to, you know, rent it for this amount. So I think it feels very shiny object to me is because the houses are typically in really good condition. It, you know, it's pretty. It's a nice location. So like the the comfort level is going to be easier for like, you know, someone who's starting out who maybe doesn't have any investments to buy it. Um, and then I, th- I hear this a lot. I want to change the hospitality space. You know, I want to create a home that, you know, has all these X, Y's and Z's that I've never experienced in Airbnb before. Never having been in the hospitality business. Yeah, I know. Like everything that you're saying, it's like ex- exactly aligned with kind of how I feel. It's like, I don't really, <clears throat> I, I do have reasons why I'm not a huge fan of short-term rentals. But one of my biggest reasons why I'm not a fan is because anytime that you hear everybody doing something, like it just never turns out good. I don't care what it is. And, right. um, you know, whether it's Bitcoin or or like you could just go down the list, like once the herd kind of like gets in on something, uh, it, it just it makes me very nervous because right. without even analyzing it, I'm just like, if everybody's doing it, it's probably oversold. It's probably overbought. It's probably you know, um, I don't know, but, um, so what's your plan now is your plan just to continue. So you, you built a team, 
on the real estate side? And you've got how many team members do you have at this point? Like what's your what's your vision for that? Um, so my, like, you know, I have a certain production goal that I want to, I want to make. Um, so like that can be its own kind of like, you know, it's, it's never going to be quite passive because it's a real business. Yep. Um, but you know, it would be its, its own business in terms of like, you know, in common being able to like service my clients correctly. Um, I still very much have a very similar pitch to when I started in 19, I represent two groups of clients. One is buy and hold. The second is development. And I need like team members to do support that amount of business. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't see myself growing to be a, even frankly, you know, 20 person team because like, it's a lot to manage as, as we all know. Yeah. Um, But I I want like really quality and like to really be very protective of my team and the space that I'm creating. Cause it's just so much time. If you like are introducing the wrong people to the mix. So excuse me. My vision with the team is about probably five to 10 team members, like active agents and a lot of support to make sure that like everything's going to go really smoothly and, and we're going to deliver the right product and transaction to, to the community. Yeah, I, I've uh, I've become very anti big team for, for most people because I don't think it produces and I'm talking about for the the um, the team leader. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think it doesn't usually produce what the team leader kind of set it out to be. Right. And, you know, you correctly pointing out, like, it's not passive at all. Um, and so it's like, you know, you grow it big and then it becomes like, just, you're just churning constantly. And then it's like, well, wait a second. Did I get into business to churn through people? Like, I mean, you know, we're here, you got into the business to invest. I got into the business to invest. We're here in theory to be passive, right? So you can't be passive when you have, you know, people just coming and going, um, so what's the biggest piece of advice that you would give to an agent? Like you came in, you know, you had a lot of success pretty quickly. Um, what would you say to the agent who's like, and, and I'm sure you, you, you have probably even people on your team or people that you've interviewed, like they want to invest, <clears throat> but they haven't like they, 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 they know they should, but they haven't yet. Um, in terms of, of them, like becoming an investor. Yeah. So like, you, like the, the person that they're selling, they're an agent, they're doing pretty well. They know that they should invest. They've read books. They're seeing what you're doing, but yet they haven't like pulled the trigger yet. What would you say to them? Um, I think that first and foremost, they should definitely kind of get their affairs in order. But, you know, sometimes it, it's credit, it's debt, it's obviously down payment, right? Like as soon as so that is all set up, um, I think the next hurdle is not finding the deal because there's a million deals. Like I have a decent amount of property. Most of them I found on MLS. So don't subscribe to the fact that only good deals exist off market, you know? Mm-hmm. So um, so finding a deal, you will find the deal. Don't worry, right? Um, but it's executing. Agents are very easy to, to say, hey, one, two, three Main Street's an amazing deal, an amazing deal. You got to get it once in a lifetime. But when they, you know, when they have to put their own money down, <laughs> all they do is talk themselves out of it. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's trying to remove that fear um, and really like executing on it. Um, I, I say to certainly my team members, I'm not a rocket scientist. I, I don't think that I'm, I'm insanely smart, but what I, I am willing to do is execute. You know, if the opportunity is there and it makes sense, you know, let's go for it. Like there's no thinking back because I, for the most part, have never regretted anything I bought. Um, yeah. And, and and that goes along with your story kind of in the beginning, which is like, and, and I have the same, the same story. It's like, usually the stuff you buy in the beginning isn't what you end up doing. It's just, you got started. And, and like, you know, if you had overthought, you know, getting into the the properties in Manchester or Fall River right. and, and you look back and you say, oh, well, this, this, I thought when I bought this, I was going to get this right? and I didn't. So I'm not going to cry about it and quit. I'm just going to sell it or move on, or I'm going to reallocate and then keep, you know, moving forward. And I think that's the biggest thing is like, you're, you're going to make mistakes. It's it's not possible to not make a mistake. You almost just have to start. And then, you know, once you start, you'll figure it out. I mean, you'll figure out whether Manchester's your town or fall river or wherever. And, um, it takes some time, but again, the educational piece, that's just kind of what 
you know, I keep, you know, hearing from you and I, I know that you run, you know, educational events yourself, or you at least used to in the past, I bet you still do. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's all about getting educated. Um, yeah. I mean, the fact of the matter is like any agent that's, that's, you know, looking at an opportunity and like thinking about it and, and when you're hopefully like moving forward with it is far more equipped to be able to like make that a successful opportunity than any true consumer that's starting out. Right. And that's you know, like lenders, you, you know how to underwrite a deal. Hopefully, you know, you just have the right resources. Like your tool, toolbox is at minimum halfway full. And yeah, they yeah. have nothing. They have a, a wrench. Yeah. And I didn't pay you to say that, but that's, that's my whole like agent investor thing is like, like you said, your toolbox is at least halfway full. Right. So like, imagine the people and most people are not agents when they do this. So it's like, right. they have way more to kind of overcome. Right. Um, all right. Well, I want to thank you for, for coming on. I haven't chatted with you in a while and I'm I'm glad to see that you're still kicking butt. Um, and, um, any final last words for the audience? Besides uh, no, taking I, action? Say that again. I said, besides just taking action, taking action for sure. Um, and I guess just be a little patient about, about this market, right? Like it's, it's a really, it's been a very funny 2022 and yep. it will probably be a very funny 23, especially with the election coming up. Um, any sort of like, you know, election term is going to have some change in the market, um, so have a little patience and just like kind of p- persevere through. Um, it was absolutely my pleasure to be able to catch up with you and be able to share some of my story. All right, Leanne. Thank you. And guys, we'll be back next week with another episode of the Asian Investor Podcast. All right. I'll talk to you guys later. Thanks. Bye. Thanks again for listening to the Agent Investor Podcast. And especially thank you for sharing the show with other agents and reviewing the show on iTunes. Every time you share the show and leave a review, you are potentially changing someone's life. To get free weekly education strategies and to connect with other agent investors across the country, join our free Facebook group at agentinvestor.com. Again, that's agentinvestor.com.